everyone, it's Sarah with RegisteredNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to be going over hyponatremia. In my previous video I covered hypernatremia so be sure to check that out. So in this video what I'm going to cover is I'm going to cover the types of hyponatremia, the signs and symptoms, the causes, and the nursing interventions. And with this I'm going to try to give you some clever mnemonics to help you remember this for your nursing lecture exams and for the NCLEX. Now after this video be sure to go to my website registered nurse rn.com and take the free quiz that goes along with this video. It's going to test you on hypernatremia and hyponatremia. Okay, so let's get started. Let's talk about hyponatremia. Like I've said all the time, anytime I have one of these huge words, I like to break them down to know what type of electrolyte I'm dealing with because there's a lot of different electrolyte imbalances. So first part of the word is hypo. What does hypo mean? It means underneath or beneath, low. Uh, natremia, part of that, the N-A-T-R part, is a prefix for sodium, so I automatically know that I am dealing with the electrolyte sodium. And emia means blood. So when you put all that together, you get low sodium in the blood. Now, what is a normal sodium level? A normal sodium level is 135 to 145 milliequivalents per liter. Anything less than 135 is considered hyponatremic. Okay, let's talk about the role of sodium in the body because in order to understand all those causes, the signs and symptoms, you have to know how sodium works in the body. Okay, sodium is a very important electrolyte that helps regulate the water inside the cell, intracellularly, and extracellular outside the cell and water and sodium love each other water always wants to be where sodium's at so wherever sodium is more congregated at water h2o will run to where that's at and that's what's happening with hyponatremia and i have a video on the tonicity where i covered hypertonic hypotonic and isotonic and showed you how in different situations the cells will swell or become dehydrated and what types of fluids are used to treat those conditions and if you're interested in that video a card should pop up so you can access that but what's happening with this little illustration here in hyponatremia you have low amounts of sodium in the blood extracellularly and according to osmosis remember the rule of osmosis Anything of a low concentration wants to move to a higher concentration where everything else is at. So here you have low amounts of sodium and you have water. And remember, water loves sodium. And there's more sodium inside the cell. And that's where water wants to be. It wants to be where sodium's at. So what happens is that all that water rushes inside this cell, expanding the cell, which can cause it to burst. And this is again caused by osmosis. And this affects cells everywhere in your body. And one of the cells that are really sensitive to this is brain cells. Whenever they swell, you're gonna probably see a patient get confused. And that's why whenever this is happening, the patient will have confusion because the cell is swelling. Now let's talk about the different types of hyponatremias because you have different types and the patients are gonna present a little bit differently and they're caused by different things. And then after that, I'm gonna give you a mnemonic on how to remember the different types so you can be prepared for your exam and help really simplify it for you. Okay, first let's go over the first type, which is uvovolemic hyponatremia. This is where the water in the body increases, but sodium stays the same. So you're not going to see edema, which is swelling and like the extremities or in the body on this patient, like how you will, will with hypovolemic hyponatremia. And sodium stays the same. But what happens is because you have that increased water volume happening, the sodium becomes diluted. So whenever you go to measure the sodium level, it's going to be diluted with all that water and it's going to be low, so hyponatremic. And there are some causes of this, and I would remember this because this is usually a big test question. Um, causes of this type of hyponatremia is what's called the SIADH syndrome, 
syndrome, which is the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormones. See why they have it short because it's a big long word. And what happens is that ADH, which is an antidiuretic hormone, is being increased in secretion in the body. And whenever this happens, the body starts to retain water. And whenever it retains water, in turn, it dilutes sodium. Other causes are diabetes insipidus, adrenal insufficiency like Addison's disease. So that's the causes of that. Now the second type is hypovolemic hyponatremia and this is where your patient becomes dehydrated. Um, they have a loss of blood volume so you're seeing a decrease in sodium and a decrease in water. And common causes of this are vomiting, diarrhea, NG suction, your GI secretions are really rich in sodium, so whenever you have continuous NG suction going out, you're losing a lot of sodium. Diuretic therapy that wastes sodium, any type of burns, and excessive sweating. So the patient is becoming dehydrated, and they're just losing all of that. Next, the third type is hypervolemic hyponatremia, and this is where your water and your sodium both increase in the body. And this leads to fluid volume overload. So you're really gonna see swelling on these patients. However, the sodium becomes diluted. I know that's like a paradox, even though they're both increasing, doesn't it seem like the sodium should be increasing too? However, no, because what happens is that your total body water and your sodium are regulated differently and they're regulated independently of each other. So it actually causes sodium to decrease. Now, when are you gonna see this? You're gonna see this in patients who have CHF, which is congestive heart failure, kidney failure, excessive infusion of saline solution, or liver failure. So let's simplify this and put it in a mnemonic so you can remember it for exams. Okay, remember the phrase, no sodium. The um, symbol for sodium is NA with a positive sign, and here we have it laid out. Each letter will correlate with what it uh, means. N for sodium, NA. Uh, Sodium excretion is increased with renal problems like the NG suction, the vomiting, the diuretic therapy, the sweating, diabetes insipidus, and, uh, which is where you have decreased aldosterone secretion and you're wasting sodium. So remember that all those problems right there are where you're having um, sodium in uh, excretion increased. Okay, O for overload of fluids. Again, remember, this is where we're going back to the hypervolemic, and you have congestive heart failure, you have the hypotonic solutions, and liver failure, and that will dilute your sodium. N for sodium, NA again, um, your intake of sodium is low. This could either be through a low salt diet or MPO status, they're just not getting enough salt intake. A lot of your elderly patients may suffer from that. And the last part, the A, for the antidiuretic hormone is over secreted. Remember in the SIADH and adrenal insufficiency and all that can cause hyponatremia. Now let's go over the signs and symptoms and the nursing interventions. To help you remember the signs and symptoms of hyponatremia, remember the phrase salt loss because here you have low salt. Okay, so the first S of the word salt, remember seizures and stupor. The patient's probably gonna have this if it's really low. Next, for A, abdominal cramping or attitude changes, meaning confusion. They may have came in alert and oriented, their sodium level dropped out and now they're confused. Next, L, lethargic. They're going to be tired. They're not going to want to get up and move. They're just going to want to sleep. T for tendon reflexes diminished and trouble concentrating. Again, that's back to the confusion. And remember, salt has a plays a role in your muscles and your nerve conduction. And law, L, loss of urine and appetite. O, orthostatic hypotension and overactive bowel sounds. S, shallow respirations, and this happens late, and this will be due to the weakness of the skeletal muscle, so that will be a late sign. You're not going to see that at first. And then the other S, last S, is spasms of the muscles. 
Okay, now nursing interventions. This is definitely the thing you want to pay attention to because your professors are going to hit on this and NCLEX is going to hit on this. So I've hit the highlights of things that will probably come from a test. Okay, first intervention, of course, is you want to watch your cardiac status, your respiratory status, neuro, renal, and GI status. All these systems are going to be affected. Next, now if the patient is having hypovolemic hyponatremia, this is what usually you'll do. Remember, this is where the patient has probably had diarrhea, vomiting, and they've just lost all that water and all that sodium, and we've got to get them better. So usually what you're going to do is you'll administer an IV solution, sodium IV solution, to restore that balance of fluids and sodiums. Typically what is given is 3% saline. This is a hypertonic solution, so commit that to memory. And this solution is really hard on the veins. It's typically given in a central line usually, and they like to give it in a area where you can really monitor that patient. The nurse doesn't have a lot of other patients like the ICU. Because since it's a hypertonic solution, it works by shrinking the cell down. It pulls all that fluid out of the cell because remember before the cell was swollen and Whenever you do this, you if you do it too fast, you can cause the patient to go into fluid volume overload. And you want to watch them and you want to give that, that slowly. So make sure you commit that to memory. Now if the patient is hypervolemic, which is the opposite of the hypovolemic, this means that they have too much fluid, they've retained too much fluid in the body and too much sodium, but the sodium's become diluted. Um, what will you'll do with that is you'll restrict their fluid intake. We don't want them to have any more fluids on board. Some cases, some doctors may order diuretics to excrete that extra fluid on the body but conserve the sodium. And if the patient has renal failure, they're not a candidate for a diuretic therapy, so they may be prescribed to go get some dialysis to suck that fluid off. Okay, next, if the patient is having SIADH, that was that antidiuretic hormone insufficiency, you're going to restrict the fluids. You don't want them to have any more fluids. And this is usually treated with an antidiuretic hormone antagonist, so it goes against the antidiuretic hormone. And commit this drug to memory. Um, a lot of physicians like to prescribe declomycin. Um, you may be familiar with this if you've taken pharmacology. This is part of your tetracycline family. So as the nurse, you need to know how to administer this. Typically, you do not give this with any food. Um, especially dairy and antacids because this binds to the cations and it affects absorption so you won't be absorbing all the declomycin. Um, next, another big thing you want to remember is lithium. If you have a patient who's taking the drug lithium, a lot of mental health patients are prescribed this medicine, you're going to want to check your lithium drug levels because the body is going to conserve lithium and it's not going to be excreted as much whenever your sodium levels get out of whack. That's why whenever you're teaching your patients whenever they're going home on lithium to make sure they consume enough salt and whenever you don't have enough salt it throws off the lithium. So that's another biggie you want to remember. And last but not least, you want to instruct the patient to consume sodium-rich foods. That's usually not a problem here, especially in our society in America. Um, this is really a no-brainer with what foods are rich in salt, but remember there are things uh, your professors may want to throw some tricky ones out there. Um, first thing is bacon, of course, butter, canned foods. That's a big one. A lot of people don't think of canned foods having a lot of salt in them they think oh I'm buying some vegetables can canned corn so that's healthy no has a lot of salt in it and test questions like to throw that in out there it'll say the patient says which statement to you they're um, they have a high sodium level what would you not let them eat and canned food might be an option cheese hot dogs lunch meat processed food and table salt so that is about hyponatremia now be sure to check out my other videos on electrolyte imbalances and be sure to take that quiz on the differences between hypernatremia and hyponatremia and thank you so much for watching and please consider subscribing to this youtube channel